Good morning, St. Luther. And to all of you who are listening this morning, uh, it is again that we find ourselves uh, under the grace of God to, to be sitting here again this morning. And we are just thankful that out of the goodness and the abundance of his grace and his mercy that he has allowed us once again to be here. And for that, uh, we thank him. Uh, as always, uh, the word of the Lord is good, and we have uh, another great lesson uh, this morning. And our adult young topic uh, for today is wisdom that astounds and offends. Our children's topic is don't let the doubters stop you. Our background scripture is Mark, the sixth chapter, the first through the sixth verse the seventh chapter, the first through the 23rd verse. And our print passage can be found, Mark the sixth chapter, the first through the sixth verse. And we come to our lesson today, uh, uh, looking at the, the ministry of Jesus. And, and we find that it is in full bloom. He is in the midst of of doing some wonderful things. Uh, we are just surrounded by miracles and signs and, and wonders. And, and Jesus is, has been in the process of, of delivering uh, demons. Uh, he has healed uh, the woman with the issue of blood and he's, he's been approached uh, by one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus, to heal his daughter and he has done so much uh, he has shown so much power and authority and and control over everything that uh, I'm reminded of that story where he was he was in the ship and the storm arose and those on the ship went down to to get him and said master aren't you concerned about us and he arose out of his sleep to, to rebuke the wind and to, to speak to the sea. And he said, peace be still. And, and they were astonished and amazed at him. And they, they said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? So again, Jesus's ministry was in full bloom. He was doing everything that he came to do. And, and his, 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 his messages were so powerful. His, his miracles were so amazing. And, and so he now comes to this point in our lesson where he and his disciples are returning uh, to Nazareth. And one might think that on, on the heels of this, that, uh, what he would have found would have been such a warm reception in his own town amongst his, his own people. After all, this was the savior of the world and he had proven who he was. But as we get into our lesson, uh, we go to our print passage. And as I begin to read from Mark 4, uh, one through three. I want you to pay close attention to the words that are spoken about him. Man, you, uh, these are his people, his homeboys, the ones that knew him when he was young and were very familiar with him and his family. And he was in the synagogue, meaning he was amongst the believers. And so I'm reading uh, from Mark, the fourth chapter, the first through third verse. And it says, and he went out from thence and came to his own country and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath day was come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished saying, from whence have this man, these things. 
And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph, and of Judah and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. As I said, he was in the synagogue. He was in the church. He was amongst believers. He was in his own hometown of Nazareth. And, and you hear these little subtle jabs that they were throwing his way. They said, whence have this man? And what wisdom is this which is given unto him that even such mighty works are wrought by his hands. Can you hear the multiple jabs and put downs thrown at him? And you know, to the young folks, uh, and, and I mentioned this because of uh, our children's topic, you know, call it what you want, uh, but doubters, naysayers, or haters, as we call them today, have been around long before now. And one would ask the question, why amongst his people would he have received such a, a demeaning reception? And I'm sure that many of you can sort of identify with this and you know, the problem here might be uh, the expectation is the real culprit here. And I say that because the astonishment came about because this is what they didn't expect. His, his wisdom superseded anything that they expected. But when you think about his, his reception, the words that they use to describe him, these were words that I think as we can identify with not receiving favor amongst our own is that sometimes we even have uh, less than expectations of our very own selves. And, and what I'm saying is that because I don't expect much of myself and you are one of the ones that I grew up with, you are one of the ones, I know your family, I know your background, I know where you came from, I know what your father did, because I, I'm not expecting anything of myself I don't expect anything of you either. I certainly don't expect this kind of authority and wisdom and power with which he spoke. And it is often time that this is the issue that we face even in the black community to where I don't have any expectations of myself. So if you, if you seem to rise up and be successful, I certainly don't have that type of expectation of you because I know you. We, we come from the same cloth. We, we grew up around the same people. We lived in the same neighborhood. So I have no expectation of, of greatness or, or of wisdom that would come from you. And so I know that this hurt because I can imagine that you probably found yourself uh, in the same position where those who were familiar with you, those who knew your background, those who surrounded you didn't expect anything to come of you. So we find Jesus here uh, being demeaned and, and minimized because they just didn't expect anything great out of Jesus. It's not like he came from a well-to-do family. He came from humble means. Uh, he, he, he wasn't from a wealthy background. His father was a carpenter. And so 
we expect maybe that you would be a carpenter. But even if we don't look at uh, the situation with the family, we look at the church because this is where he was. He was in the synagogue. And so it makes me think, what was Jesus' response? That I come in full bloom of my ministry. I'm performing miracles and works that have never been seen before. I am speaking with wisdom that has never been taught before. And what is it about us that we can be astonished by the message, but somehow we can't accept the messenger? This has been and probably will be for those without wisdom a problem that continues to go on. I have no problem with the message, but I have a problem with the messenger. And it's because that messenger, he can't be anything if he comes from the same surrounding from which I come from. And this is uh, the problem that uh, was almost a, a stumbling block to Jesus, but we know that Jesus was going to be one who was going to complete his mission because he was full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of wisdom, but just because you are full of wisdom, just because you are full of the Spirit, don't think there won't be haters. Don't think that there won't be doubters. Don't think that there won't be stumbling blocks placed in your way. You know, the word says that no weapon formed against me shall prosper. Did not say that the weapons won't be formed. It just said that they won't prosper. And so Jesus, after all that has been said in the fourth verse, here is his response. But Jesus said unto them, A prophet is not without honor, but in his own country and among his own kin and in his own house. How often have we heard that it might very well just be those who are the closest to you who would not receive the change that you've made in your life. Maybe you haven't been what you are now. Maybe there's some skeletons in the closet. Maybe you haven't always been saved. And those who knew you back then, they refuse to allow you to step into your ministry. They refuse to accept that you're a brand new creature. Isn't it funny how no matter how far we go back or how firmly we stand in the present, that the character of people tends not to change all that much. But this is what Jesus was saying. Wherever I go, the places and the cities that I've been through, the crowds flocked. They wanted to hear what the Savior had to say. They wanted to be healed of the Savior. They had faith and belief in him. This was a bad man, if I must say so myself. In fact, when Jesus was on his way to perform a miracle, he performed a miracle. He was approached by the woman with the issue of blood when he was on his way to Jairus' house. He didn't ask anything. He didn't speak anything. It was the faith of the woman that performed the miracle. She believed. But guess what? She wasn't from Nazareth. She wasn't familiar with him as a young boy. She didn't know his parents and what they did for a living and where he came from. All she knew was that this was a man of power and authority. And all I need to do is to get to him and but touch the hem of his garment. That is the power of faith. That is the power of belief. That is the power that we see beyond the physical stature of the man. And we see the wisdom 
and the power that he possesses, that wisdom that can only come from God. And lastly, we speak about the fact that they were offended. You were offended. What did he do that offended? Well, as we know, uh, his words that he spoke challenged the customs and the traditions of those religious leaders. They didn't like what he had to say because it threatened their very existence. And it brings to mind the power of the word of God that it will offend. For in Hebrews, the fourth chapter and the twelfth verse, it says, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the hearts. Reminds me that, you know, sometimes the truth hurts. We may not want to hear it, but when the truth is spoken, you may even acknowledge the truth. It hurts. But here's the thing. But a wise man will receive it. You know, uh, when we're sick, medicine doesn't always taste good but we'll take it anyway because we know it's good for us. And this is the power of the word of God. And finally, as Jesus left them, left behind their unbelief, left behind their doubt, left behind their mocking and demeaning of, of him because of who they knew him to be. In the fifth verse, it says, And he could there do no mighty work, save that he laid his hands upon a few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went around about the villages teaching. You know, we have to ask ourselves a question. Is it possible to limit God by our own limited thinking. You know, we sometimes place limits on each other. And by habit, we tend to try to place limits on God, our creator. Well, I have news for you today. He cannot be limited. There is no greater power. There is no greater authority. There's nothing that he can't do. There's no one that can be compared to him. But what you can do is you can limit your own blessings. You can limit the very works that he is more than capable of working in your life. And we think of the amazing things that he has done and, and we are astonished and we are amazed. But do you think there's anything that can amaze Jesus? The lesson says, yes, there is. He was amazed at the unbelief of his very own people. It's a sad state of affairs that our maker, our creator, our savior does not have the full acceptance of the very people that he came to save. All because they could not see past the physical man and see on the inside the wisdom and the authority that he possessed that was placed there by God. And we oftentimes in our very own lives when the word of God is being proclaimed, we can't see past the individual who is doing the proclaiming. We can't see past the man and see the God who is working through the man. 
And this is why many today who claim to know Jesus don't truly know him. Just as those in Nazareth felt that they knew Jesus, they didn't know him. They only knew of him. And we today can't make that same mistake to think that we know Jesus when we haven't bothered to get to know him on the inside. See, we can't truly and adequately uh, judge a book simply by looking at the cover. If you want to determine the true value of the book, you got to open it up and read. And when we come to this point where we have been talking about wisdom every week, the thing about it is that you must seek it. You must desire it. You must go after it. For there is no other way. Have you ever heard someone say, they know you? When you know, they really don't know me. They simply know of me. And that's not going to be good enough to know of Jesus. You're going to have to go far and beyond that. You're going to have to get to know him in an intimate and in a personal way. And that can only be done by seeking him through his word. The word says he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. And my advice today is to not be caught up by the outward appearance of man. Not to be caught up on those things that are natural. We ask that you seek a God who is supernatural, who can do all things except fail. This Jesus that we speak about today, he's our Lord, he's our Savior. He is the one who has made it possible for us to see God as he is. And as always, I would advise you today to seek him now, seek him diligently, seek him while you can, for the grace of God is not forever. There will be a time when he will come back for his people. And it is my desire and I hope that it is your desire to be full of faith. For without it, it's impossible to please him. And the only way that we're going to see him is by faith. For it has been written that the just live by faith. We thank you for listening to us today. And we ask that you look toward the hills from which cometh all your help. Know that you serve a God that can do all things. Seek him today while he may be found. May God bless you.